All right, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Good afternoon. Welcome to our event here today. My name is Chris Newell, and I am the executive director and senior partner to Wabanaki Nations for the Abbey Museum. And I'm coming to you live from Bar Harbor, Maine for Digital NAF, Digital Native American Festival and Basket Makers Market. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we have two hours of uh, getting together with some of the artists that uh, we would have had here. Um, unfortunately, due to the public health crisis, we have uh, the uh, here at the Abbey Museum, we have pioneered uh, bringing uh, these events to you in a virtual format here. So this is another iteration, much like Digital Amen. Uh, Digital Native American Festival, though, more focuses on uh, local Native artists. We're gonna see a lot of Wabanaki artists here today. Uh, and we're going to be having time to interview with them. They're going to present what they have for sale. And for those of you, uh, oftentimes, uh, well, I'll be repeating this throughout uh, the broadcast today, those of you that would like to buy from the artist, we invite you to come to abbeymuseum.org. If you look under the markets tag, you will see under that tag a link for artist profiles for digital AMM as well as digital NAF. And you can find all of their information uh, including uh, artist bios and uh, um, uh, artist statements, pictures of their artwork and contact information for each of the artists. So for those of you watching today and you see a piece from one of the artists and you're really interested in finding out how to get a hold of that piece and buy it for yourself, just remember to go to the abbeymuseum.org website page and look for the artist profile that you are seeking. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, once again, uh, coming to you live here from Bar Harbor, Maine, and uh, we uh, have uh, a great lineup here for you today. Some of the artists we're going to feature live in today's event are Jennifer Neptune, Barry Dana, Francis Soctoma, uh, James Francis. Uh, we're going to do a tribute to Dr. Molly Neptune Parker, right about at the ladies and gentlemen. So make sure that you are tuned in for that. We have a special tribute video lined up uh, with a message from uh, Elizabeth Neptune, Molly's daughter. Uh, Elizabeth James Perry will be joining us today as well as Butch Phillips, Teresa Secord, and Gabriel Frey. So that's the lineup that we have of artists that will be joining us for Digital NAF today. But we also have profiles of many, many other artists uh, that you would normally see if you came to the live event, and we'll be mentioning those folks uh, as we go throughout the day. In hour one, it will be Jennifer Neptune will be up first, followed by Barry Dana and Francis Soctoma and James Francis. In hour two, uh, from three to four, we'll be featuring artists Elizabeth James Perry, Butch Phillips, Teresa Secord, and Gabriel Frey. I would encourage you, those uh, that are watching, that you can uh, interact. Uh, the artists will have uh, several minutes to make presentations about the art that they are uh, uh, that they have uh, for sale about themselves. But we are encouraging you to uh, ask questions. If you have specific questions, if you want to see a specific piece of artwork once again, uh, please drop your questions into any of the comments, whether you're watching on Zoom, YouTube, or Facebook Live, drop your questions into the comments, and those questions will be filtered to me, and I can ask them directly to the artist for you. So please take advantage of the interactivity. We welcome questions from you, the audience, uh, as we go throughout the day. So lots on our table for today, and pretty soon we're going to be starting with our first artist, which is going to be Jennifer Neptune. Um, so uh, once again, if uh, you're just joining us, uh, today is the Digital NAF event, and if you are looking for ways to buy from the artists themselves, uh, you will be going to the abbeymuseum.org website, look under the tab of markets, and then look under that for the uh, digital AMEM and digital NAF artist profiles, which include pictures, artist 
bios, uh, as well as artist statements and contact information so that you can contact the artist themselves. The Abbey Museum has no, uh, uh, is not the middleman to any of the transactions with the artist. You can contact the artist directly themselves through their, uh, uh, their uh, requested medium and uh, uh, talk about what they have for sale or possibly commissions. So uh, keep those things in mind. But also today is a great learning event. Uh, because a lot of these artists are Wabanaki artists. Many of them feature traditional Wabanaki arts, including basket making today. And we're really going to have a chance to dig down into some of the traditional Wabanaki arts. So for those of you uh, that want to have uh, some education, you know, this is a really great opportunity here uh, for some first person perspective from the artists themselves, you know, from uh, our Wabanaki nations and some of our neighboring nations uh, close by here today. So we really have a great sample of the NAF artists here that are available to join us today. Um, so yes, I, I am so excited to be here. Um, this is our second online virtual market. And, uh, you know, this time around, we're only two hours today, uh, but we do have a, a, a robust set of uh, artists for you to, uh, to check out. Now, our first artist that we're going to be bringing up for you is Jennifer Neptune, and she'll be joining us here in just a minute. Uh, Jennifer Neptune uh, comes from the Penobscot Nation, um, works mostly in basketry, ash basketry, especially with uh, the use of sweetgrass, and she also does beadwork. Um, and uh, she's from the Penobscot Nation, a writer, uh, herbalist, worked in the field of cultural preservation for over 25 years, and she's the current head of the Penobscot Nation Museum. And uh, she did join us for Digital AMEM. We're so happy to have her back here for Digital NAF. And it looks like she is all lined up. And it's nice to see you, Jennifer. Hi, how are you doing? Good. It's nice to see you, too. Yes, as always. And I love the background there. That's Jennifer's shop, by the way. Uh, those uh, ribbons that you see back there, well earned. Uh, Jennifer, I'm going to turn it right over to you. And uh, once you're done, if we have any questions from the audience, if uh, we'll ask those. And if not, I have a few questions for you. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more. But we want to let the world uh, get to know you. So I'm just going to hand it over to you. And we're going to spotlight Jennifer for the next few minutes, ladies. For now. Thank you, Chris. Excited to be here today. Um, I've been involved in the festival for the whole entire 27 years that we've held it. And I'm really excited that the Abbey found a way to make it work. We have never missed a year. The weather has never stopped us. Um, in the early 2000s, we even held it right after a hurricane. The hurricane blew out at like five in the morning and all the artists were there setting up at seven. So um, there's always a way to move forward. Um, I'm Jennifer Neptune. I am a basket maker and a bead worker. I'm a member of the Penobscot Nation and I live on Indian Island, Maine. Um, my baskets are made out of ash and sweet grass. And I use a lot of sweet grass. This is a sweet grass flat that I'm working on now. And they're called flats because they're kind of short and they're used for storage. These were used um, by women in the 1800s and on as sewing baskets and they come in all different sizes. So I make them from teeny tiny miniatures right up to fairly large ones like that. Um, they use a lot of sweet grass and this is the time of year when we're all out starting to pick grass, um, trying to get it nice and long. So I'll be doing that soon. It takes a lot of time um, to use sweet grass in your baskets because you have the time of gathering and harvesting it, preparing it, braiding it. Um, it just takes a tremendous amount of time. So just to give you an appreciation of the sweet grass. Um, another basket that I have available is a pineapple basket and I'll back it up for you. <laughs> um, this is, it has a cover, the cover comes off and this is all made with double split ash. It's really, um, nice ash. I don't make these too often because it takes so much of the really good stuff to, to do these. So these are pretty rare. I do a lot of miniatures too. So um, here's the bottom 
of a little one that I'm working on today. And this is the block that it's going to be on. This is a really old block. So the tools that we use to weave with um, can be quite old. They get passed down through generations and uh, this will fit on the block and um, become a basket eventually. Um, some of the other styles that I do are sea urchins and this is the block that I would weave it on. And I do these in all different sizes too, right down to tiny. Um, let's see, beadwork. So I also do a lot of beadwork. Um, I do a lot of reproductions like the chief's collars, uh, the um, peak caps, kind of clothing reproductions I do a lot of and also like little beaded bags. Um, it's really time consuming and um, a lot of silk ribbon work, glass beads. Um, and here's another little one that I'm working on. And this will end up being either a little necklace or put onto a bag. <laughs> also, I wanted to point out too, um, you know, a lot of people are camping this summer to get out and just wanted to put a shout out about emerald ash borer and how important it is not to move firewood. So if you're planning to visit Maine or, you know, go camping, get your wood when you get to your location. Um, moving firewood is the main way that the emerald ash borer is getting transported and moved to new locations. And we have three, um, infestations here in Maine now, and um, we don't want it moving any further. It um, kills all ash trees, and its favorite tree is um, our black ash, our brown ash trees that we make the baskets with. So it's a huge threat to this tradition, and so just want to put that out there. Please don't move firewood. Let's keep this tradition going for as long as possible. We've worked so hard um, together um, to ensure that this tradition survives and that we have younger basket makers. And um, it's just so ironic all the years of hard work that it's an uh, invasive beetle that might stop it. So um, just want to put that out there. Happy to answer any questions that you have about uh, basket making, bead working, traditions, emerald ash borer. All right, so thank you so much, Jennifer. Yeah, no, I, I actually had a question about uh, the emerald ash borer. Uh, you, you've answered it partially, uh, you know, the impact on, on Wabanaki basket makers. If we think about the longevity of um, Wabanaki basket makers and, uh, you know, the conversion from utilitarian basket to uh, a market economy uh, where fancy basketry started to, to gain prominence, um, what does uh, the, the presence of the emerald ash borer in Maine, what, you know, what, what is the general feeling as a, as a basket maker, as, as a Wabanaki person who, who uh, you know, uh, our creation is tied to the ash tree itself? Um, what is the, the general temperature or the feeling amongst basket makers about the presence of the emerald ash borer finally uh, arriving here in the state of Maine? Well, I have to tell you, like the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance and the University of Maine and the State Forest Service, USDA, um, we've all been working for the past decade to prepare for its arrival. We knew it was coming. We knew what it was going to do. Um, we've sent basket makers to Michigan to actually see the damage and learn how to identify it. But I have to tell you, knowing that it was just a matter of time, it was devastating when it was finally found here. Like the hopelessness that you feel is indescribable. But, um, you know, I have a lot of faith in the goodness of people to do the right thing. And, um, and also that, you know, our forest makeup is different. So it's not entirely hopeless in Maine. The foresters, you know, point out over and over again that, we have stands of ash that are fairly spread out and far apart. So in Michigan and in the Great Lakes area, it was like lighting a match and putting it down and it just could spread and there was nothing to stop it. But here we have these buffers, you know, between stands. And so it, it will go a whole lot slower moving on its own power. But the thing that we can't control is, you know, people. 
and what they do moving the wood. And again, it's, it's a moving firewood mostly that's moving the beetle. And so if we could stop people from doing that, that would give us so much more time for science and nature to catch up. Another thing in our favor is um, the woodpeckers. So may may is what we call the woodpecker in our language. And it has always been a helper in our stories and woodpeckers in mass from the Great Lakes to Maine kind of figured out at the same time that emerald ash borer is a good thing to eat. And so they're helping us again. So I do have hope um, that it can buy us some time to learn how to deal with it. Thanks for, for that introspective. I, I knew that you were you're kind of on the leading edge of uh, what's going on with all of this. And, and it, it, is, it is scary, just even as a non-basket maker, as a Wabanaki person, to think of the loss of the ash tree in our own homelands uh, for, for various reasons. But, uh, you know, for the basket makers especially, I mean, that's, uh, it would be a devastating loss. And, um, you know, thankful to hear that there is at least a piece of good news, uh, you know, in just the way the science is, is uh, you know, kind of uh, working itself out. Um, and also, I, I read recently uh, in Michigan a discovery of a, a protein that can be added to uh, new trees as they get planted that actually the emerald ash borer doesn't like. And you can grow uh, uh, new crops of black and brown ash trees that the emerald ash borer actually won't go after. Um, so there's a possibility going forward in the future. But just as you said, we got to be responsible, uh, you know, here uh, in the state of Maine as Mainers, uh, not to transport firewood so that we can slow that spread. So we have that time uh, to finally get to that point. So thank you so much for pointing that out. Um, now, as uh, someone that, uh, you know, is a, a, a fellow organizer of this event, um, just thinking, and, and someone that's been here for 27 years, just thinking over your years of being with the Native American Festival, what are, what's a favorite memory that uh, you, have, you might have or anything that stands out over the years from this particular event? Oh, there's so many. I think uh, one of the things um, that stands out to me is just watching like children grow up and, you know, coming as babies sometimes or little tiny kids and they grew up and they became artists themselves and had their own table, um, you know, in the past few years. And that's pretty amazing to see that, um, that change over time and to see like all our hard work, like producing new artists and all that talent having a place to express itself and come out. And it just makes me really, really proud um, of the work that we've all done um, to ensure that, you know, we always have a place um, to show our work and um, sell to the public directly and, you know, just show how awesome the artists in our communities are. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, the uh, the fact that the uh, the Maine Indian Basket Makers, you know, collected together under the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance, and uh, things are done with a, with a team a aspect, a community aspect. Um, and you think back to the first days of the Native American Festival, and there was a lot of really older artists back then, you know, the tradition, uh, you know, it went from a community tradition. And then uh, with the advent of uh, television and radios and things of that sort, there was a distraction maybe and it, it uh, kind of transferred to a family tradition. But uh, the old, uh, back in the early days, the average age of the artist was, you know, tended to be on the older side. And uh, these days we are seeing so many young artists. And not only that, we're seeing the generation of those artists teaching children uh, and the children are winning awards uh, in Santa Fe and places like that. So it's a beautiful thing to see. And uh, you can really come uh, to Bar Harbor every year, next year, come in July, and uh, you know, please come to the festival and see these young up and coming artists as well as those masters that show up every year. Mm -hmm. So I thank know you. the elders um, that aren't with us anymore, I'm sure they're smiling down and are so proud of all the younger ones that have come forward. Absolutely. And, and, and for your work as well. Thank you so much, Jennifer. So uh, we're going to move on now. Jennifer, I'm going to say a good to give you a, a second to say goodbye to everybody. And then we're going to move on with our program here. We got our next artist lined up and ready to go. But thank you so much for being with us. Uh, and go ahead and you know, give your own salutation. All right. Willie Wen, thank you so much for being here today. 
All right. Thank you so much, Jennifer. So once again, such great artists that we have lined up for you here today. And the next artist that we have lined up for you, there's, uh, you know, so much that could be said about him. Uh, this is Barry Dana that we have lined up uh, next coming up in uh, our artist profiles here. And uh, Barry is an artist that works in multiple mediums, uh, but when it comes to basketry, works with uh, the older medium, which is birch bark. And birch bark basketry is something that, or, or just the uh, birch bark itself, is one of the most utilized uh, natural tools that we have. Our, our homes traditionally are made and covered with birch bark. Um, the birch bark canoe uh, amongst woodland people uh, is a technological advantage that allowed journeys of a thousand miles, you know, so, um, and it can be used for just about everything from collecting sap, uh, you know, to uh, artist pieces that, that we see from, from Barry. Uh, Barry himself, he's from the Penobscot Nation. Uh, he's a teacher. Uh, he's an artist, former chief of the Penobscot Nation learn traditional skills and values from his elders uh, growing up, uh, carries those with him today. Uh, and uh, once again, uh, specializes in uh, birch bark with animal, floral and traditional designs etched into the service. Uh, surface, but also uh, porcupine quills and works in other mediums as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Barry Dana. Welcome, Barry. How are you? Oh, Leone. Quay. Um, boy, that was such a great introduction. I don't know what to say. I'll, I'll start with again saying I'm from the Penobscot Nation and also um, as a reminder that a lot of us Penobscots and other Wabanaki people are from the Abenaki people as well. So I consider myself Wabanaki and that's been my passion my entire life is to bring back, you know, revive the culture that, you know, we, we suffered uh, the loss of over many, many generations. And come to find out, we actually didn't really lose. We, it, things, these things just went sort of dormant. I got together six uh, middle school boys and tried feeding them for a full week. And in nine days, we put together a birch bark canoe. This was uh, a project that I just had in, in mind. I didn't know how to make a canoe, but I figured, well, we, might, we, we just need to do it. And that's been my whole process. Uh, my whole philosophy is um, if, if it's in our culture, we need to do it. So I got together this group and we went out and we gathered the material and we threw together in nine days a birch bark canoe, brought it to the reservation. The boys got in it and they paddled it and the people who stood on the banks were just in awe. And they said they hadn't seen anyone paddle a birch bark canoe for over 60 years on Indian Island. So that's really been my whole life's passion is reviving our art, our traditions, our culture, our ceremonies. Uh, every uh, Labor Day weekend, we get together and we do a 100 mile sacred run. This is to reconnect us with our sacred mountain. It's to call upon the ancestors to watch over us, to help our people. We have a lot of suffering that's still going on today in terms of disease, uh, colonization, so we just need these type of things to keep our identity strong. And for me, um, for, you know, reviving the art and being able to teach the art and produce it and, and, and even sell it. I don't mind selling it. it. It seems odd sometimes to produce a piece and then somebody says, I gotta have it. And then I, I sell it and it's like, I'm not so sure sometimes that's what I make it for. Cause it, it's, it's like, it's in me to make it. And then, and then it gets sold and I guess I, I have to separate from that. And, um, but that, that allows me to continue doing the art. So that's just the way it works. So I'm not always in it for the money, I'm in it for the preservation. So I was asked uh, many moons ago, and I guess it was 27, one of the first uh, shows that we got together as a basket maker. And I said, geez, I'm, I'm not really a basket maker. I, I do a lot of things. I tan hides, I make drums, I make canoes. I do a lot of things. I'm not really a basket maker. My wife said, but you can make baskets. So why don't you make some baskets and go to the show? I said, well, I don't make ash baskets. I know how to make ash baskets, but I don't make them. She says, you make birch bark baskets. 
And I said, yeah, okay, well, why don't I make birch bark baskets? Because that really is, in my opinion, um, one of the very first receptacles a Penobscot or Wabanaki would have made um, in terms of a uh, functional basket. It hold, you can get it to hold water, you can heat water in it. And it, like, as you mentioned, uh, we, we make our canoes and our wigwams from birch bark. So it is, in my opinion and my experience, one of the most fundamental materials that is part of our uh, 12,000 years of uh, living in this area. You know, when a fire comes and goes, and, and I picture that as when the glaciers receded, I think birch would have been one of the very first trees to uh, reclaim the area. So um, as I speak, why don't I, why don't I show you guys some of the some of the work that I do? So this is to revive very traditional stuff. There's nothing artificial in my baskets. It's 100% traditional. These are. Let's see if I know how to do this. Hey, there we go. This is a very special basket that we call the Molly Ocket, and it's a medicine basket. And we just. It was almost visionary how we came to that name because uh, we wanted to recognize this lady who was Abenaki, who was a healer, and she used our plants uh, to, to do a lot of her healing. So we wanted to create a receptacle that would hold plants and only to later find out Molly Ocket carried her plants in a birch bark basket, very much the same shape and style as this. So um, sometimes that's how we revive our, our traditions is through uh, genetic memory, if you will. So this is a birch bark, and you can see the lid here. It's got the porcupine quill embroidery. Uh, dragonfly is my clan. It, the rim is laced with spruce root around a cedar hand-carved rim, and there's actually sweet grass there as well. And the, the inspiration for the artwork is traditional design that you see here and it's done all the way around the basket. So this is called traditional design. And then there's what's called contemporary, where you just sort of freelance and take it outside of the traditional realm, but bring in the traditions through contemporary style art. So this is called the bucket. And it's etched on winter bark. Now this is very, very difficult to gather. You cannot make a mistake taking the bark off the tree. And I know everybody's thinking, oh, are you killing the tree when you take bark off? No. When you take bark off a tree for baskets, you're not taking much bark. You're taking uh, bark off only the very best of trees. So you're leaving in the stand all of the other trees that don't measure up for good etchable bark. So, so it's extremely um, sustainable. Okay. So that this is a bucket and we would we would use the bucket to store food. You put a certain plant in here and it repels the, the bugs. And this is a small bucket and we do large, medium and small. Let me show you uh, my large. Actually, it's the extra large. <laughs> this is a sheet of bark. That's all one piece. There's no lid. It would take, I don't know what it would take to make a lid for this, but I want to, in my etchings, bring back the ancestors. This is where we get our teachings. This is what's important to us. I want them, their spirits to come back to us and teach us what is important for Wabanaki people to survive, not only colonization, but survive what we're facing today, climate change and whatnot. So when we depict things in our culture that are important to us, it's not just for the sake of art. There's meaning in every one of these symbols and drawings. So this is all etching. etching. There's nothing added to the bark. This is bark that's been gathered in, in the late winter, early spring. It provides an extra layer called the red cambium. I, I have an idea of what I want to do, and then I get the bark wet and I scrape, just gently scrape it off into, and then the under bark comes through. This is a one of a kind. This does not get ever get reduplicated. There's no mold. 
So you'll never go into someone's house and have a basket like this. You'll be the only one in the world that'll have this basket. It's really museum, probably uh, quality. I haven't looked at this for a while and I'm really amazed at how much stuff I got on here. So I'm having fun, bear with me. But you can see the ancestors in this and uh, it's really important to preserve the culture, not just you know, create an economic uh, engine. So thank you so much for that, Barry. That was, I'm having some feedback for some reason. There we go. I think we got it now. Uh, so thank you so much for that, Barry. Uh, and, and, and it's true, you know, uh, uh, you know, the the traditions of our people. So it's, it's sometimes it's it's more than just about money, right? Um, it's really uh, how do we live sustainably within. Uh, the system that our ancestors did for over 12,000 years, you know. Um, it, uh, sometimes pe people talk about European colonization as civilization arriving here, yet uh, we had, uh, you know, w very little war, uh, and we were able to use uh, and survive quite healthily and heartily and happily without the use of money uh, or any of those things, and everything was provided by nature, and we had, uh, you know, with it's written into our languages, that we see um, what we would call in English language nature as simply a system that we are part of and that our job is to really help sustain that um, and to make sure that it, it, it survives for future generations. And, um, and I hear that all in what you're saying today. It's not just about uh, making a basket today. It's about teaching it. It's about passing it on. And it's about keeping that knowledge alive. Um, so thank you so much for, for bringing that perspective here and bringing that traditional knowledge here. Uh, the birch bark is, uh, you know, uh, the, that's the first thing I learned to use in the woods as a child, uh, you know, just learning how to start a fire because uh, the, the, the little papery parts that you pe peel off the outside will uh, start in a fire, whether they're wet or dry. Uh, it's the best fire starting material out there in nature. And that was the first lesson I learned as a very, very little kid, uh, how of the value of it. And I so appreciate uh, what you bring to the table uh, and also what you pass along. Um, you know, so, I mean, um, you know, the real question, you know, when it comes down to this, you've already answered some of our questions here that the, the harvesting does not uh, um, uh harm the tree, uh, even for, um, uh, for the, uh, the canoes, the very large pieces that we take. Uh, and that's the beauty of working with this particular bark is that you can do it without harming the tree and the tree survives. Um, and so when it comes to these skills, uh, you know, how, how did you learn? Uh, was it a lot of time in the woods being self-taught? I mean, it really takes that experience, right? Well, yes, um, I was mentored in basket making by an ash basket maker and she was really one of the world's best Madeline Shea and she wanted me to make ash baskets and I learned and I said okay but I wasn't compelled to make them for some reason I just sort of went off on my own and started studying birch bark and I made a birch bark canoe it really ever before I made a basket uh, that first canoe never saw the water by the way <laughs> it, it, it wouldn't have held up um, I ran into a friend who had made some birch bark baskets and I just went nuts about it. It was actually at a trip to the Abbey Museum, Sudermont Springs. I saw a pattern there and I knew what it was for. So I drew it in my brain. I come home, I drew it on paper, I cut it out and folded it up and sure enough, it was a bucket design. So I, I've basically been off and running since then, but it is a lot of trial and error, um, experimenting and learning how to carve, learning what Trees make good bark, not all trees make good bark. Learning how to um, split cedar by hand because these cedar rims cannot have twisted grains. You know, the canoe as well. It has to be completely straight grain cedar, which is very difficult to find. Digging the spruce roots uh, is not technically difficult. It's just physically difficult. Uh, we went yesterday to get roots and uh, I killed about 150,000 horse flies. So <laughs> this is what this is what the culture brings you in direct connection with nature, and uh, you know I can I can't express enough how important that aspect of our traditions are. It brings us back to nature. 
All right. So thank you so much for joining us here, Barry. Uh, we do have to move on. We got other artists that we got uh, come uh, lined up here, but uh, I just wanted to give you the last word, give your own salutation. It's been such a pleasure having you on here, learning from you, uh, and especially seeing your art. And uh, don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to see Barry's artwork, go onto the Abbey Museum website, look under the markets, and then look for uh, the artist profiles, and you will find Barry Dana listed there as well as his contact information. And uh, you can uh, contact him for any of these baskets that he has here for sale today or uh, ones that he'll have in the future. But for now, uh, Barry, you can uh, say goodbye to uh, everyone here. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you and see you. All right. Okay. That was awesome. So uh, yes, ladies and gentlemen, like I said, we have some really tremendous artists that come to the digital, uh, not digital, to the Native American Festival and Basket Maker Market every year. Uh, we do have to move on. We have another awesome uh, artist lined up for you here, and she comes from the Passamaquoddy Nation, and this is Frances Soctoma. So Frances deals, once again, uh, she's a basket maker as well, works with Ash Flint Basketry, uh, also with beadwork. Um, and uh, in her artist statement on the, on the artist profile, uh, she says of herself that as a past quality artist, every time I create something new, I'm reminded it's not new. Our families and peoples have been here for over 13,000 years and everything I make is building on their legacies. All that comes from me is made possible from their knowledge of our homelands. To do as my ancestors did is to know them. To see the art they created is to hear their whispers. My work continues to let their stories flow while reminding us of the hardships, strengths, and love that allowed us to be here today as Wabanaki people. And with that beautiful statement from Frances herself, I'm gonna turn it over to Spotlight, Frances Soctoma. Thank you so much for joining us here today, Frances. Thank you, Chris. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I, 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 as, as Chris said, I'm a Passamaquoddy artist um, from Indian Township from Madoffneygood. I grew up um, around baskets just, you know, from the time that I was born. My grandmother is Molly Neptune Parker, um, and she really instilled in us the value, the beauty, um, the cultural significance of basket making within my family. Um, Jennifer Neptune mentioned earlier that one of the really cool things that, or one of her um, best memories that she has of um, being around the Native American festival was seeing some of the little ones grow up um, and start making baskets. And that made me smile because I'm one of those little ones. Um, I think the Native American festival started might have been a year and a half old. Um, and I think, and I'll have to double check with my mother on this. I think I've been to all of them except one. I think there was one year that I had a conflict as a, a middle schooler or a high schooler um, and I ended up not going. Um, so this is a tradition that we've, we've looked forward to every year. Um, so it's a little weird not being in Bar Harbor around all the basket makers that I grew up around, um, around new basket makers who have kind of, I've watched grow um, and inspired me to grow as well. Um, and very, very um, odd not being around my grandmother during this time, um, watching her sell baskets. Um, so I started learning from her when I was probably about, maybe about six. There were a lot of workshops that she did in our communities, her along with other basket makers. Um, and there were these, these like community workshops that the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance would hold. And my gram was always one of those teachers, her, Charlotte, um, Mary Gabriel, there were just so many who were around um, in teaching and taught me um, a lot of different skills that I still use at a lot of my baskets today. Um, and they taught me to make more, I guess I would say more traditional fancy baskets, um, like these one, like this one right here. Um, and I don't even think it was my gram. I don't remember which basket maker taught me how to do the little diamonds, um, but it was definitely an elder from our community um, who taught me how to do those. And so every time I think about when I make those, I think about that first basket I made where I did those diamonds and we were in the cafeteria at my school, um, just learning from this elder whose job it was to teach you how to do some of the embellishments during those community workshops. Um, and so starting at six, I kind of, I, I kept going. Um, 
my grandmother, as I said, hosted a, um, was a teacher at one of these workshops and outside these workshops, I was also able to learn from her at home, um, just working on different aspects. Um, and she really instilled in us um, this idea that if you're going to engage in a cultural activity, if you're going to be a basket maker, if you're going to do what our ancestors did and what's been passed down from generation to generation, you're going to make sure that you do it right, right? You want to honor their memories and honor their legacies um, by putting in the same amount of hard work and care and attention to detail that they did um, and that we continue to do in all of our creative work. Um, so I started doing some more of those traditional forms um, of baskets and, and sort of branching out a little bit more as I got older. I probably didn't start selling um, separate from my gram until maybe 2016. I had always shared a table with her at these different events. And so throughout the year, we would make um, you know a handful of baskets, me and my cousins, and then they would always be on her table with her lined up along her work as we watched her um, sort of market us and tell her story and say, you know, oh, yeah, this is my granddaughter, Frances. Um, these are her baskets. You can see, you know, she's putting flowers on hers just like mine. Um, and so really learning kind of as we went um, how to interact with people and how to connect with people and really valuing that connection. Um, and then sort of when we were on our own, branching off and submitting our own applications to events like these, um, which was always really nerve wracking because people would start asking me questions and I don't think, um, I don't think I had practiced enough, like just talking to people about myself. That's always something that's really uncomfortable. Um, so when you, you kind of go off on your own and you don't have your gram there, it was, it was always kind of just like, oh no, um, I have to remember all these things that she said. Um, and really start, start using your own voice. Um, so it's kind of a unique experience has been a unique experience starting as a little one um, and then coming up and being here on my own. And so I started um, with that basket that I showed you um, and then started branching off into doing things that were a little more complicated, um, featuring more color, more do, braiding my own sweet grass. Um, we don't have, we used to have um, some sweet grass braiders who would braid a bunch of sweet grass and my grandma would buy from them in bulk um, and we would integrate their braids into our baskets. And we don't really have a lot of sweet grass braiders anymore. Um, so it's kind of fallen on the artists themselves to, to braid some of their own. So there are some like these um, where I'll braid some of my own sweet grass. And you can see more, um, another example where I did one for a little flat that I made that's on my website linked to my NAF portal, or my NAF profile. Um, so a lot more, as I started getting older, doing a lot more um, sweet grass, more intricate weaves, more intricate diving patterns, um, and really starting to vary in size doing um, doing some, some larger baskets, but also really focusing on doing some smaller baskets as I've gotten older. Um, one of the really amazing things about going to these markets and being around people, not just from your own community, but other communities, um, is you get to see the kinds of things that they're working on and it's really inspirational. And so Jennifer Neptune um, is one of the other basket makers who has inspired me to do smaller baskets, um, more on the miniature side. I've made a few, including a, a miniature uh, flower basket that looks very similar to a large one that my gram did. And my grams would be probably about this large um, in comparison to something that's this small. Um, and then as I've gotten older and kind of mastered some of these different techniques that I remember from when I was little or that my gram would talk me through or that Jennifer would talk me through. Um, I've sort of started thinking a little bit more about how our art forms can spark discussion on, on our culture, on our communities, but also on like community events and our connection to other things. So there is a, um, a basket that I wanna show you that I made that's currently on display at the Abbey. Um, real quick. It's part of the um, the Lunky Edelman exhibit, the Take Care of Everything exhibit that's going on um, right now. And it's there, I believe, through the end of the year. And, uh, hopefully I can do it under full screen. Um, and so this is part of a piece that I created for that. Um, it, he was really very challenging, um, but he's more the center of that exhibit um, or that um, 
artwork that I made alongside a bunch of other artists. Um, so he's on his own, I call him the defensive blowfish, um, but he is also, um, the larger piece is called Glunky Azine, take care, let's take care of each other. And really trying to raise awareness of, um, raise awareness of how our actions as people on land, whether it be through um, exploiting fossil fuels or littering or just not interacting with our environments in a good way, impact our relatives underwater on the land um, and how all of our waterways kind of connect each other. Um, so here he is alongside um, kind of his, his, his family. Um, I created some rockweed along with him um, and a couple of little sand dollars, just some other underwater life um, who we start, who, who are impacted by our actions, whether we see them or not, whether they're from here or not. So obviously we don't really have puffer fish around here. Um, it's all connected and we all have a responsibility wherever you are in the world um, to sort of take care of them. Um, and so I, I'm kind of continuing to think about how our different traditional art forms can sort of impact those, those conversations, um, but then also expanding out into other um, art forms that can really sort of serve as that kindling for these really important conversations that are, can also be really difficult conversations that we should be having um, out of respect for ourselves, our relatives, and, and all of creation. All right. Thank you so much, Francis. What beautiful work. Uh, you know, you really are taking, uh, you know, the basket making tradition. And, and what we're seeing from the artists is that each and every one of our artists take it and make it some way their own. Uh, you know, it's always based in culture, you know, but uh, and for you, you know, uh, you know, you're a younger uh, basket maker yet. Uh, you know, does not matter what age you are, you know, when it comes to the passion uh, and the, the skill, um, museum quality pieces are being made by people of your, your generation. And when I was growing up, that was a very, very extremely rare thing. So as somebody that's a little bit from the older generation, I want to say thank you for your work. It's really beautiful. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, uh, it seems like as though a lot of your inspiration comes from not just the traditions of our people, but on, on the way you react into the world of today. So are there other examples of, of pieces that you have that are like that, that, that kind of react to the world of today? Yeah, so um, I'm also in graduate school um, and I've done a few art classes sort of when I was an undergrad um, and also now I'm pursuing an, an art degree at the University of Maine, an intermediate art degree. Um, and when I've been done some more of those like academic settings, um, I've been connecting more to um, sort of our changing food systems and the way that environment, the environment has impacted what we can and cannot eat um, or what relatives we end up seeing, we have seen in our waters before, but maybe we're not seeing now because they have restricted movement. Um, and actually there's a series that I'm working on that I'm hoping to release by the end of this summer. Um, three pieces within that series and I think it'll be an ongoing series the more that I create. Um, that's just called Calling Our Relatives Home, um, raising more awareness and I guess offering prayers to see more of our underwater relatives but even just other relatives who maybe you don't really see as here anymore because the environment has changed so much. Um, and so this is one of the prints that I created um, featuring a sturgeon um, really trying to emphasize him being here in our, our homelands and being um, one of the, our family members that I, I wanna see. I've never seen a sturgeon, um, but they can't, they're huge, um, like larger than people huge. Um, and so it's it's kind of, yeah, just, just calling attention to that and just thinking about some of the stories that I've heard our elders tell that are, are valuable to me, important to me and sort of, um, I'm just sort of reacting to them and just thinking about some of the things that maybe Maybe I'm kind of missing out on, but we might see might see them back again. All right. So I want to say thank you so much for joining us here today, Francis. Uh, you know, it's too bad we can't see you in person. I uh, would love so much, you know, to have you back next year, of course. 
Um, you know, and we, we very much look forward to that. Uh, we do have other artists that we got lined up, so I'm going to move on with the program here. But I wanted to give you the last word before we sign off. Uh, and just uh, once again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for telling your story and showing your beautiful art. And for those that are interested, once again, go to the abbeymuseum.org website, look under markets, look under artist profiles, or just read in the comments. We have a direct link to Francis's uh, artist profile, and you can find out how to contact her there. But for now, uh, go ahead and say your goodbye, Francis. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Willie Wans, Sida Wen, thank you everybody um, for joining me here today, and I look forward to seeing you next year. Um, definitely check out that profile, because you. Um, I'm starting to post more, post more things on Facebook, Instagram. Um, so if you want to keep in touch, please do. Okay. Uh, so yeah, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have another artist lined up. But before we moved on to him, I just wanted to make mention we do have uh, not all of the artists from NAF, of course, are being featured today. Uh, one of the artists that we uh, were hoping to feature, he's actually a board member of the Abbey Museum, is Richard Silly Boy. And I just wanted to make a quick mention that we have his profile up on uh, our artist profiles as well. Uh, Richard uh, is uh, from the Aroostook Band of Micmacs. Uh, of, uh, just a delightful person and uh, specializes in utility baskets, specifically the potato basket. Uh, and for those that don't know, if anybody's ever grown up uh, doing hand picking of potatoes, uh, the process involves, you know, uh, the harvester going by and bringing the potatoes up out of the ground and then the, uh, the hand harvesters going and uh, you can see the pictures of the potato baskets there. Uh, the hand harvesters going and throwing the potatoes between their legs into those baskets. And then the baskets, of course, you know, emptied into larger barrels that would be picked up by the truck. So it was very much a part of the harvesting process. And in the state of Maine, uh, you know, uh, Micmac, as well as other Wabanaki potato basket makers help to really uh, give the tools for uh, the potato harvest every year. Uh, in fact, they were so good at making these particular baskets that a lot of the potato basket makers could make them without using a form. Uh, and I've seen videos of uh, talented ma basket makers that could, uh, once the raw materials were processed, could make a basket within less than two minutes time, uh, just you know, off of eyeballing it, it would be perfectly round. Uh, these baskets are super strong, they're durable, they can hold 50 pounds of weight, no problem, they last for years. Uh, and they, uh, uh, the tribes have been so good at making them that when Richard uh, and his family, uh, you know, uh, in their history, when they were selling them, they sold them for 50 cents a piece. Uh, these tremendously strong uh, pieces of uh, work that, uh, you know, sustained uh, an industry, the potato industry in northern Maine, uh, in a way, you know, as part of the process of, uh, of harvesting them. Uh, you know, and it's been a tradition uh, of many basket makers over the years of making utility baskets and keeping that art alive as well. So we just wanted to make a quick mention of Richard uh, as we move forward. But now we're going to be moving to our next artist, and that is Mr. James Francis. Uh, James Francis once, all, once again comes from the Penobscot Nation, and uh, he is the uh, uh, husband of Jennifer Neptune and uh, works in multiple mediums, uh, not just in art, but in history as well. Uh, you know, and uh, so there's a lot to be learned from James. Uh, and I'm just waiting to see if he's going to pop up on here, uh, see if we have him or not. Let me check my messages from the Abbey team. Uh, so yeah, there he is. He's coming up. Oh, excellent. And he's got a piece of his artwork in his background there. So without further ado, uh, I don't want to hold it off. I'm going to let James just kind of announce himself here, talk about all of the multiple mediums of art he works in, as I said, not just uh, visual arts, but also in art histories as well, uh, just about anything, and, and visual uh, film as well, if I recall. So James, uh, I'm going to turn it right over to you for your spotlight. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. Um, hope everybody can hear me. Um, so I'm going to share my screen as I go through the, the many um, different mediums that I, that I work with. Um, let's go here. Is that coming up? Nice. So one of the things that I started many years ago with a, a project for the museum at the Penobscot Nation is we painted 13 drums to represent the three 
uh, 13 um, cycles of the moon all in the language. And that started me on the road to um, start painting hand drums as uh, an art practice. And uh, most of these come as commissions. I really feel that uh, a commissioned drum is uh, very personal because I take the time to get to know the person who is receiving, receiving the drums. Um, you know, in this instance, painting a drum with a Harley Davidson motorcycle on it for a museum curator is, it's only a sale to that one person. So um, I really concentrate on um, very um, uh, commissioned work for a, a very specific person uh, when, I, when I do the hand drums. Um, I also do photography. I'm out in the landscape a lot in my, my work as a historian is really rooted to homeland. And um, this birch bark canoe was just, this was up by Sugar Island where we do cultural tourism. So um, and we were just leaving the island and the sun was setting and I captured this. Always good to have your camera with you um, to capture the photographs. Again, cultural tourism is what we do in the summertime. So I have a lot of shots of, um, you know, clients coming down the river. This is Jason Padilla uh, leading a team down the, the river after four days on Sugar Island learning about our culture. Um, again, Sugar Island um, teaching people how to pole canoes as part of uh, what we do. Um, but this is a, I really like this shot. Um, I'm pretty prolific with Photoshop. Um, no, there's not nine of me, um, but in this photograph, there certainly is. Um, you know, this is um, the type of work that I, I, I do is uh, photo manipulation. And um, this is called um, Selfie 9X. Um, as a fundraiser for our local team Penobscot Paddling, uh, I painted, I believe, nine paddles uh, that were auctioned off all for fundraisers. Um, I really enjoyed uh, doing these paddles. Um, they were fun. Um, and they really um, inspired me to uh, continue this, this type of work, um, painting on paddles for people to use or not to use. I don't, once it leaves me, I, I don't care. Um, I often paint scenes from, this is an old postcard scene from Indian Island um, with the tribal flag flying, which is a little out of time. Um, this picture is uh, roughly between 1930 and 1947. Oftentimes we can't uh, date these pictures, um, but we know when certain structures came and when certain structures left. So this is done in acrylics. Um, another acrylic painting. Uh, the tree to the right in this painting is actually in the shape of the Penobscot River. And um, this is harkens back to um, the water famine legend that we have that says Gluskop took a tree and he struck a frog and the frog released all the water and then the water flowed down the shape of that tree. Um, and so I wanted to honor that story and other stories that involve moose um, by incorporating that into my painting. In fact, I think this painting is part of the Abbey collection. Um, for the bicentennial, I was asked to do a centerpiece for the Maine Historical Society's um, bicentennial exhibits, um, which uh, is that now on exhibit today. And this is the the called the Phipps Proclamation, but it's also called the Scalps Proclamation. This puts a price on Penobscot's heads as this document, um, quite a large document. Um, I think it's five feet by three feet. It's very big. Um, it's got a silhouette of a man uh, with its arms outstretched um, and a Penobscot word and a big red slash across the, the text. And that in Penobscot means uh, we walk on eternally even in the face of, um, you know, a genocidal document like this, um, we will walk on eternally as a people. And uh, this statement I wanted to um, share with the, the people of the state of Maine for the bicentennial exhibit. I started painting with dots, um, a lot of dots. Um, and this is a, a piece that um, my, my daughter actually owns. Um, but it's, um, you know, I 
started to um, really play with this idea. And this uh, within the dot pattern is, is a floral pattern. Um, although underwater, I wanted to capture that kind of the flower element to this. Um, a friend of mine owns this one. I always like it when I can go visit my art. This one, however, went to Germany. This is a, a much larger dot painting um, and uh, the kind of same elements with the fish spear and the salmon. I always try to really ground uh, my artwork uh, with our culture, with the culture. Again, um, and this one is available for sale. This is, uh, you know, a wasus, uh, the bear, and a um, what I call a laced moon. It feels like uh, lace around it. Um, nighttime sky, all done with dots. Even the black below, you really can't tell from this picture, but that's dotted in um, shades of black. Um, one thing I started doing is um, elders and ancestors. You can see my wife holding her a picture of her great grandmother um, here. And um, you know, after after Frank Lauren died, I um, I did a, a picture of him for for the family uh, as a gift. And um, this is uh, my grandmother Beatrice, who was really an inspiration to me as a as a young artist. Um, and I also do time-lapse photography. And um, I'm gonna go to a different screen and, and hope that, um, uh, hope that I can, hope that it will uh, actually um, show you one of my time lapses. But if not, all my time lapses are um, on my Facebook page, which is James Eric Francis. And let me see if I can share that screen. So the process of a time lapse is to take uh, thousands of photographs in one session and string them together as a video. This is from Facebook. I don't know if it'll translate, how much it'll lag. Um, but this this um, this video, which is probably not going to show, I'm not even going to try. Guys, go to my Facebook, James Eric Francis. Um, that particular video was shot from 2 a.m. to 7 a.m. on the 4th of July um, from Orson Island, Maine. Um, beautiful uh, moon going across the sky. We call it Nibauset, you know, Skywalker. And um, then the fog rolls in. So it's a very dramatic finish um, to a uh, just a beautiful capture. And this isn't video. No, this is individual shots, um, high resolution um, photographs, all strung together. Just, and I think every five seconds I took a picture and then we, I strung them together. So it's, uh, it's different than actual video. Um, but that's, that's my uh, share there. So I'm gonna stop sharing. And I just wanted to, share one one um one image that i've been working on if i can if it's gonna let me it's too close there we go that's a little better so it's disappearing okay this is all done with dots and it's a uh, a couple under indian blankets watching the sunrise near a wigwam and um, I wish it would show it. Maybe if I got rid of the background. Uh huh. So as I was saying, this is. It's, I call it directly at dawn uh, because it's pushing out the nighttime sky at the top. And where you see the trees come together is a image of a turtle kind of in the negative space. But it's a couple under a turtle blanket watching the sunrise across the water uh, next to their wigwam. Uh, but as I said, this is completely done 
with dots. Um, I don't know, insanity on, on my part. Um, <clears throat> but that's um, all I got to show you today. Uh, Chris, you had some questions? Yeah, no, we, we had a question come in from uh, one of our viewers and uh, they wanted to ask with commissioned work, uh, how do you go about learning about the person you're creating for? Do you interview them? Are they members of the community? Um, yeah, I interview them and we talk about what's important to them. If they are uh, indigenous native people, um, I talk. To, I wanna know about their family, um, maybe their clan, uh, what's important to them, what they identify with, um, you know, like the motorcycle thing, um, this museum curator person uh, is into Harleys, she's got a few of them. And I incorporated on the saddlebags of that Harley um, designs from one of the Penobscot items that are in her collection. And so um, incorporating that all into that very personal piece is, is really important. But yes, I, I really like to get to know uh, people. And also I've even gone as so far as I listen to audiobooks when I paint. And I ask them uh, to share a book that was important to them. And I will listen to that while I paint. Excellent. All right, James, thank you so much. Your art is so beautiful. It's so extremely detailed. Uh, and I, I see the traditions in our stories of, uh, you know, Wabanaki peoples, especially Penobscot peoples, but, you know, to see the Leicester, uh, you know, being used as, as in the art and, and all of those types of things, you know, those traditional spears. Uh, I can't say enough about what you're doing, uh, what you have done over the years. So I really want to say in a, a, a hearty appreciation from all of us here at the Abbey for joining us here today. Um, and uh, we are going to move on. We do have a lot of other artists. Um, so I'm going to leave it to you to uh, give your own salutation. But I just want to say from, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for being here today and, and for showing your art. Uh, Willie Winnie, and uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for taking the time to be here. I appreciate it, Chris. Thank you. All right. So we will see you in the future, James. So ladies and gentlemen, we are in hour two. And uh, we have a special tribute that we have lined up for you today. Um, before we go to our next artist, we are gonna have a tribute for uh, Dr. Molly Neptune Parker. Um, we lost uh, Dr. Molly Neptune Parker not too long ago, June 12, 2020. Um, and uh, at 81 years old, uh, passed away surrounded by her family uh, after a brief stay at Calus Regional Hospital. She was born in Madokmiguk, so uh, she comes from my home community, somebody I grew up around, uh, not just her, but her entire family. And as I always mention to others, uh, that when it comes to my memories of Molly, not only did she inspire greatness in herself, uh, and you know, within her own family, uh, many of which are notable uh, people in the community, uh, but also in e everybody around her in the community. And uh, as Teresa Secord said in a recent article, uh, she was, uh, you know, she's one of the last of uh, uh, a generation that were selfless teachers. Uh, she was the longest standing uh, president of the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance. Uh, she has won multiple awards. Uh, there just can't be enough. Uh, I encourage you to look up uh, her obituary uh, and, and to see the, uh, the immense amount of impact that she has had on this world. And um, she also ran the Native American Festival and put this event on uh, during her time as a head of the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance. And we here at the Abbey did not feel uh, that this year would be appropriate to go by without a tribute to Dr. Molly Neptune Parker. So uh, with that, we have a tribute video featuring uh, her one of her daughters, uh, Elizabeth Neptune, and uh, also uh, some photos and a song by, uh, we were given permission by Lauren Stevens, Passamaquoddy Tribe, uh, singing the Passamaquoddy humbling song. Um, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, this is our tribute to Dr. Molly Neptune Parker. Thank you for joining the very first digital Native American Festival and Basket Makers Market. My name is Elizabeth Neptune. I'm one of the many children of Jeanette Parker, who many of you know as Molly Neptune Parker. Unfortunately, my mother can't join us today. She passed away after a brief battle with cancer four weeks ago. Although our hearts are still heavy, 
and will be for a very long time. I felt it was important to share with you some of her thoughts on uh, the importance of the festival itself. The festival became a tradition, not just for her, but for her children and many of her grandchildren. It is something that she felt that was important to do. Not just to be able to come together to sell her baskets, but also to be able to see the incredible talent of many of the Native American artists um, that feature their work and are, that are featuring their work as part of today's event. To her, it was not just about, um, again, not just about those sales, but it was about bringing people together both the Wabanaki communities. It was one of the few times during the year that we all got together. And then also to be able to share some of the incredible talent and some of our culture with the public at large. So thank you again for joining here today. I hope that all of the, the artisans that are, that are sharing their work today have an incredible and successful uh, event. And I wanna thank you all of the audience members for uh, joining from wherever they may be during this trying pandemic time. As uh, To honor my mother's legacy, we've also established uh, a Molly Neptune Parker Mentor Fund that will be distributed as a scholarship of, of, of sorts to Wabanaki people. And thank you for those in advance that have contributed, that will contribute, and those that have contributed already to that fund. We anticipate that the fund will be ready to distribute in early 2021. Thank you again, and thank you for coming together, and thank you for honoring um, my mom. That's why I know so deep and I'll have good cook and must know. That's why I know so deep and I'll have good cook and must know. That's Gratuit à nos sorti pan à la mingard moussam snook. Gratuit à nos sorti pan à la mingard moussam snook. Tiro am que weotine. Ma wam kaba zotine. That we are no so deep on Alamingard Kiko was no. That we are no so deep on Alamingard Kiko was no. Jeroam que well tine. Ma wam kaba zotine. What a webuma wump covers out in a gratuit and also deep on a lingered meat dog snow gratuit and also deep on a lingered meat dog snow.
Thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, uh, you know, the, the loss that's felt by the family and by the community, especially to lose an elder like that, uh, and someone that's had so much impact, uh, but the greatness that she inspired is gonna live on forever. And, and we hope that we did, uh, you know, uh, proud for the family and for the community and for all those that love Molly. Um, it was really our pleasure uh, to put that together. And thank you to Lauren Stevens for uh, giving us permission to use her beautiful voice uh, with her rendition of the Pashmakwadi Humbling Song. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, we are gonna move forward. Uh, we have another artist lined up for you today. And uh, she is somebody uh, that I have gotten to know over the years in my time in Southern New England, living in Connecticut and working with the tribes in Connecticut and Massachusetts. And that is Elizabeth James Perry. Uh, I actually sing with her brother, Jonathan Perry. Jonathan Perry uh, sings with the Iron River Singers. Uh, Elizabeth is uh, uh, an artist in her own right though, uh, and also a historian and uh, amongst uh, many other things that she is. Uh, she's from the Aquina Wampanoag tribe, which is uh, uh, from what is now called the Island of Martha's Vineyard. Um, and she works with jewelry, wampum. Uh, we talk about wampum a lot. Uh, you know, uh, wampum is uh, not Indian money. You know, that's a big misnomer that a lot of uh, older generation folks grew up with. Uh, it is actually, um, uh, they're originally beads that were made from the Quahog and the channeled whelk and uh, white and purple beads that uh, come from uh, the, the clamshells that are in the waters uh, where Elizabeth lives around uh, the Cape Cod area and oh, down to Long Island Sound. Um, so she specializes in this particular medium. And uh, Elizabeth, I'm going to just turn it straight over to you and allow you to begin your presentation. And then we'll have a few questions for you. So with that, Elizabeth James Perry, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Great. Um, I'm actually having to uh, put my phone down here. I was trying to do a dual screen thing. And I find that there's like a weird echo. And I don't know quite how to fix that. So uh, Waniki Sak, um, greetings in my language. I'm a Quinn and Wampanoag from Martha's Vineyard. I'm currently living on the mainland in Massachusetts. So uh, a ways south of you guys up at uh, the Abbey Museum. Um, thank you for having me uh, be part of this uh, interesting virtual version of the show. I've been going for more than 10 years and I miss going up to Maine. It's, it's very nice. Um, usually when I'm going up to Maine, I'm sharing some of my coastal traditions uh, from the Massachusetts coast. We work with the Quahog Shell a lot to make what's now usually casually referred to as wampum. And um, wampum is from these shells, they can range in size. There's, some of them are quite huge. Some of them are a little bit more modest in size. Some are really lovely and pure white. Some have a deep rich purple or blue color and some are lavender and some occasionally are like a reddish brown as well. It's rare to see that, but it, you do find them. We dig the clams ourselves and we eat them. It's a big part of our sustenance. Um, and uh, the shells themselves are so thick and durable and tough that they can be carved into really sculptural forms. They can be carved into, you know, large and small uh, old style beads. This is a necklace that I made, for instance, on smoked moose hide that's um, pretty robust. Uh, and so you can see the size of the shell and the thickness of the shell allows pretty sizable pieces, therefore, to be carved from it. Wampum is something that for us um, traditionally has a connotation, a strong social connotation. So the shell, whether it's in jewelry form as a necklace or bracelets or chokers or collars, um, the belts that we make as well, they're generally things that are really emphasizing our connections with the natural world around us. They're honoring our clan beings, a lot of which are, you know, being coastal and island people lot of water clans in, in Wampanoag history and culture. Um, so whale clan, shark clan, um, fish clan, um, seabirds, those are real, real common uh, clan identity beings in addition to some of the land mammals um, that we all share in New England like the bear and um, beaver and deer and things like that. This is uh, an example of some of the more sculptural work I do with the shell. This is a fairly thick, deep purple shell that I've used to, let me move the background here, that I've used to carve this whale. And my um, wampum work is really um, inspired by 
a lot of the old school wampum from our traditional ways. Um, I do a lot of hand tooling of my shell to create my designs. Um, like my mentors. So I was mentored growing up by Helen Adequin, who was probably best known as a basket weaver and a finger weaver, but she did a variety of different art forms, including beadwork. Um, and my other cousin, Nana Passionate, Tony Pollard, um, also very strongly influenced by my mother growing up watching her do scrimshaw because we're um, a lot of Wampanoag folks are descendants of whalers. Um, and so the use of the whale teeth, use of baleen, uh, along with some of the other materials we have in New England was a really common tradition um, up until fairly recently. It was really the changes in the marine mammal, um, the changes wrought by the Marine Mammal Act that uh, limited access to some of those things. Um, what a lot of families do now is use fossil materials to do that, that kind of scrimshaw work. But watching her do the really fine carving and inscription work also inspired me to do my own inscribing on the shell itself. And so a lot of these pieces have additional decoration that are perhaps a little hard to see on the screen, um, but this is a whale tail or a whale fluke. And this is on smoked moose with handmade wampum beads again. And there's just detailing um, to emphasize the shapes is dotting along the edge to give it kind of a lively appearance as well. And um, it's interesting to work with the quahog shell because each shell is unique. No two shells ha really have the same pattern or exactly the same color. Uh, so it makes it really um, interesting to work with and it never gets dull or boring. These are some other pieces that I created on natural milkweed cordage. Um, another part of what I do for my artwork to support my work is I grow milkweed plants here as well as wild harvesting them. And then I use natural dyes. The natural dyes are really important for me. My, um, you know, my coastal homelands are really threatened with a lot of pollution. There have been cleanups and some restoration, um, but there's a real high population pressure here in Southern New England and it really takes its toll. And so using natural materials, using non-toxic materials in a sustainable way is another way to make sure that my homeland actually stays healthy and my descendants actually have a pleasant homeland to inherit when, when we all move on. So the natural dyes that I use are things like um, bloodroot, which gives you a beautiful soft gold orange color, excuse me. Um, I use matter root, I use logwood, I use sumac berries, um, which you can gather pretty late season here. They're very tart um, and uh, they make a good um, sort of lemonade, but they're also wonderful for a red dye. And the wood itself in a sumac is actually also a very pretty yellow dye. Um, one of the other things that I do with my wampum is to create larger, more elaborate kind of legacy pieces. Um, that have a heritage and have a story and sometimes have specific communities and our nations attached to the belt's history. Um, and this is an example of a smaller version I decided to create of a very grand wampum belt that's now in the British Museum collection, it has been for quite some time. Um, it's, very, uh, it's very stately and quite important feeling. And, um, like some of our belts, it expresses the relationship between three distinct communities within a nation. Um, and I like the spirit of the piece. And so I decided to honor it by creating a smaller version so I could talk about some of those stories and some of the use of wampum. Some of my pieces end up um, going to collectors who, uh, you know, purchase um, wampum from living artists as well as sometimes antique wampum. Um, some of my wampum is also commissioned by native people. Uh, some of the wampum that I've created has been for native people to use in ceremony as well. And it's really an honor, I think, when my nation and other nations trust an artist to ask them to contribute to something like that. Um, it's a very special feeling and I'm very pleased to be able to participate. This is a wampum bias collar or alliance collar or friendship collar as it is also called. And um, it's a little hard maybe to show via Zoom, um, easier maybe to model. Uh, so it goes around the base of the neck and they're, they're very um, 
handsome pieces, but like the belts, they also have a strong diplomatic connotation, um, whether it's strands of wampum or the woven collars or the belts, uh, the emphasis overall is bringing people together um, in a good way, uh, getting people to cooperate and think about the future and think about commonly held resources and how to best use them and respectfully use them. So wampum is an excellent cultural reminder and communicator, I think as well. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And, uh, you know, it, you really kind of showcase, uh, you know, something that, uh, and you said something as well in your presentation uh, that I think is, is very important. Um, you know, for museum collections, especially, you know, the larger museums in the Northeast, a lot of them are kind of oftentimes reflections of the American conservation movement, you know, back in the 19th century with collections that would feature Plains art and Southwestern pottery largely. And uh, yet, no wampum art, right? Um, so let's let's talk about that for for just a second. Why is it important for museums to buy from living artists, uh, and especially in the Northeast, to feature the living arts that exist here? It's um, I think first and foremost, I'm going to center our commonly held Native traditions, right? Um, where we we're here here and now to support each other and not to forget each other and nobody gets left behind in community, whether it's immediate community or broader community. Um, and so one of the ways that you support each other is by investing in each other's passions and, and beautiful arts and foods and um, ventures and canoe trips. And you, know, you invest in the things that you value and believe in and you want people to feel good and you want people to do well. And I think more broadly, I would share the value of investing in living arts and living artists and living culture, because I think that that's something that the larger society in North America and beyond could, could learn from. Um, I think, you know, we, we all have a certain time with each other uh, and sometimes it's, it's really brief. Um, and you don't wanna waste those precious opportunities. I'll also say uh, perhaps in contrast uh, with the dominant culture, we think it's fine to honor people when they're alive. In fact, that's welcomed and encouraged. Um, I've really been severely limited sometimes when different organizations, because I, my background is also in marine biology, right? So I also work with conservation agencies and organizations. And I've been asked to participate in an honoring and I've sort of named a community member that I really admire, you know, um, you know, an older woman in my community or a young man who's doing amazing things uh, or singing or whatever. And I've actually had the pushback of, of because um, Euro-American culture may be more, more so values, folks who passed on saying, no, no, it has to be someone who's dead. And uh, it always stops me in my tracks because there are people right now we should be honoring. It's, you don't wanna wait till it's too late. So I suppose that's my, my philosophy too. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, that was a very extremely informative uh, presentation that you did. Uh, and, you know, ladies and gentlemen, please learn about wampum art. Uh, there are tremendous wampum artists. Elizabeth James Perry, uh, of course, her work is featured in museums, uh, you know, in, in other parts of the world, not just uh, locally. Uh, but you'll find that when you go down to the Long Island Sound area, to the Cape Cod area, that there is a, a bevy of wampum artists. And there's really multiple ways that wampum art is expressed uh, in these days and that's that's the beauty of it is that it's really grown uh, and it's it's become uh, you know it, it's blossoming uh, as we continue to go forward and we see younger artists you know starting to take part in it uh, and I think that's the beauty of it all and uh, you're part of that generation that is passing it down passing your knowledge so we really appreciate your time being with us here today uh, I'm going to leave you uh, the last word and let you give your salutation Ah, Katavatash to the Abbey Museum and Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance for having me participate today and Pish Kanash, everybody. All right, Willie Wun. Okay, so we are uh, moving on. We have another artist lined up. I just want to remind you that for those of you wondering how to buy from the artists, that if you go to the abbeymuseum.org website, uh, look under the, the uh, tab of markets, you will find another tab for artist profiles from digital NAF and digital AMEM as well. So all of our artist profiles are featured there. They have pictures of their art, bios, artist statements, as well as contact information. So if you're looking to buy 
buy from them, you want to get that contact information, you can contact the artist directly. Uh, if you saw pieces that you like today, or if you would like to commission a piece, uh, you can make that conversation with the artist directly themselves. Uh, and we have more artists that are, uh, unfortunately, we couldn't feature everybody today. Uh, and we'll be going over some of those names before we finish uh, that, that are also on the artist profile. But I want to get us ready now for our next artist in the lineup here. And uh, we have a, a recorded presentation this time around. And uh, this is Mr. Butch Phillips, who uh, also comes from the Penobscot Nation. Um, and uh, Butch is a, a tribal elder and works with many different traditional arts. Uh, he's been, uh, he's also someone that's uh, a former uh, chief of the Penobscot Nation himself. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it on over to the Abbey team and bring up uh, our presentation for Butch. Hi. I'm Butch Phillips, I'm Penobscot, and I live in Milford, Maine. I'd first like to take a moment to convey condolences from my family to the family of Molly Neptune Parker, who passed away recently. She was an outstanding and award-winning basket maker and a highly respected Passamaquoddy elder. She certainly will be missed throughout Wabnaki country. The medium that I work in is birch bark. I make canoes, birch bark, moose calls, wall hangings, waste paper baskets, and others. A short video will follow showing examples of my work and also contact information. If you are interested in any of these items, please contact me. In the meantime, please stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Uh, these are examples of some of the wall hangings uh, that, I, that I make. Um, some uh, of winter bark, others of uh, summer bark and the ones that are winter bark are etched where the winter bark has a brown rind on them and you wet that rind and with a knife you scrape away leaving the image uh, on it and this is a uh, flower hanger for the wall and so forth and these are miniature uh, one-sided birch bark canoe wall hangings with paddles and these are etched with uh, traditional Penobscot and Wabnaki designs. And that has um, the waterproofing on it on the ends and the gores are uh, actually pine pitch like I use on, on the big canoes. And these are 18 inches long. Another item I make is a magazine rack carrier for kidlin wood or small firewood. And these are made out of birch bark uh, with uh, cedar saplings. And they're etched with uh, Wabnaki designs and they're approximately 20 inches long by 18 inches high. And they're supported and laced with uh, uh, spruce root. Each has uh, designs on it of either double curve motif or animal designs. And they're very popular for putting in the den uh, cabin or your camp. I also make uh, miniature birch bark canoes. Uh, this is a three foot canoe or a one fifth scale uh, of a uh, 18 foot birch bark canoe. And all the materials are the same, all gathered in the forest as the, the, uh, the uh, original canoes. 
And the construction is exactly the same as if you were constructing a large birch bark canoe. Uh, all the materials, birch bark, white, uh, cedar, and the pine pitch, uh, all gathered uh, in the forest as you would build a big canoe. This one is of summer bark uh, with the ends, um, the decking uh, with the traditional uh, double curved designs on it. And the planking and the ribs are inserted in the traditional way um, as you would build a large canoe. And the ends and the, the gores are waterproofed using pine pitch mixed with moose fat and wood ash uh, as you would uh, in a traditional uh, birch bark canoe. And this one is one-fifth scale. All right, there we go. Thank you so much. Butch Phillips, uh, I've, I mentioned multiple mediums. He does work in, uh, he's an artist to, to the heart, but really uh, um, the birch bark is his number one medium. Uh, and so I want to thank him for taking part today as one of our presenters. Uh, we really appreciate it, Butch. I get to work with uh, his granddaughter, uh, Sage, over at UConn. And so uh, Indian country is a small place, Wabanaki peoples. We, uh, we tend to find ourselves uh, anywhere and we uh, we work to help each other out. Uh, without further ado, we're going to move on to our next artist, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, that is Teresa Secord. So Teresa, of course, was on Digital Amen. Uh, she is an award-winning basket maker, an Ashplant basket maker uh, as well, but also works with basket making materials that are somewhat non-traditional. And uh, so I'm just waiting for her to pop up on here. And we're going to begin with Teresa's presentation. She comes from the Penobscot Nation. I see her there. She okay. is a uh, former head of uh, the, Ma uh, the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance. And uh, uh, Teresa, I am not going to hold up things any longer. I'm going to turn it right directly over to you for your presentation. Uh, let us all know about you and your work. Oh, Willie, Willie Wynn, Chris, and um, Kachi Willie Wynn to the Maine Indian Basket Makers Alliance also for um, hosting this today. It's so great that, um, and the visitors as well, it's so great that, you know, everyone's showing up for each other in these pandemic times. I'm going to go right into my screen sharing, which is where I have the um, PowerPoint. Let's see, I can do this. How, how about that? Is, that? is that looking good, Abbey Museum? uh hoping um let's see i guess i guess i'm looking for a thumbs up to see if people can uh, see that chris or star if you can text me i still see myself on the little screen all right so um i don't know it looks it looks like i'm sharing the right screen so this is a photo of my great great grandfather's business card. And I put this in here to share a little bit of family history in our basketry tradition. And also um, to remind myself to mention too that our basket makers and Wabanaki people have been selling baskets in Bar Harbor for nearly 200 years. And that's one of the reasons why um, you know, we, we set out to kind of recreate that with the Native American festival and a lot of talked about, you know, so much value in that that goes beyond the retail sales. But I did want to show this business card in my family. Uh, this is a 1920 uh, replica glove box that I wove in honor of my great grandmother, Philemon Salas Nelson. And um, you'll notice um, when I show a couple more of my pieces that my baskets very much reflect her style. And um, I watched her making baskets um, when we would visit Indian Island when we were growing up, but I didn't learn from her. I actually learned from the late great basket maker, Madeline Thomas Shea, when I was actually living and working on the island as a geologist um, 32 years ago. So um, I just wanted to point out the striping too in the alternating braided sweetgrass and ash. And this, this box is for sale um, now. 
and you can you know message me as as Chris mentioned earlier. Um, so this is a photo of my great grandmother. I show it a lot, use it a lot, but it also again, like I said, shows kind of where my style comes from because I'm fortunate enough to have inherited all of the wooden forms and molds and tools you know from her basketry practice. So she's holding a sewing basket. Um, there's barrel baskets in the photo that I weave and actually an overexposed um, glove box kind of tipped up that has the same um, uh, design pattern as mine. And so this is um, the well-worn, almost rounded corner now wooden form that she wove her glove boxes on that I use and her initials are actually on that gauge. These are some of the um, wooden forms and uh, blocks that I use. And one, I love the one with her initials on it, kind of in the middle left part of the screen. And you can also see the stain where the braided sweetgrass sat. So I know like, okay, it's time to put on this much sweetgrass when I'm weaving on that form. Um, and again, some of these have been passed down to her and now to me in the 1800s. Um, there's a sewing basket form in the center bottom and a um, barrel basket on the right bottom. Again, you could see that would be the same shape and size because I wove it on the same form. Um, these are some of her gauges that I actually don't use anymore. And I think they came from her father because his initials were on them um, that he carved at least one of these. And oh, I love the white patina on these tools. We don't often show our tools. So I love seeing those photos of Molly working and um, you know, with the splitter and the gauges. So these gauges have clock spring or watch spring, which are sharpened, you know, so these individual teeth. So you can see the gauge on the right, we're kind of almost sewing with that wood that we're cutting at that point. And what's cool about the uh, patina too, is I can feel where my great grandmother's thumb was on these um, gauges. They're kind of soft, they're lightweight. And so the, a lot of the wooden forms and tools are lightweight, you know, in our hands and um, feel really good in our hands. So they're cedar or, maybe even um, spruce, but uh, balsam also. But again, uh, there's an indent where her thumb was on that one. So this is a recent sewing basket that I made um, actually last year in 2019. And you can see the wooden form is still in there on the top piece. And as Chris mentioned me, but also uh, other Wabanaki people are now integrating other materials to help conserve the ash trees because of their rarity and, and preciousness these, of these sacred trees. And this has um, the introduced material here is cedar bark in addition to the ash and the braided sweetgrass. Um, it's also a tribute to my great grandmother. You can see her holding a sewing basket. And um, I backed that photograph of her with blue velvet, which would have been like the little notions that I, I would have used that in the little notions that I would have woven like uh, velvet pin cushions and needle cases, but in this case, you know, the um, collectors, you know, aren't buying, you know, sewing baskets for actual sewing anymore. So, and uh, these are bean jar baskets that I've really started to just make again this spring, um, kind of, you know, shifting things in the pandemic. And I haven't done any of these for about 20 years. And so I, I pulled out this really special glass jar that my uncle Wadey, late Uncle Wadey, who was very good friends um, with Molly and um, actually um, wove on this piece that he gave me. So he, my uncle actually saved these jars for my great grandmother, as did we when we were growing up. I think all of our family members did. That was our job to supply her with these baked bean jar baskets, uh, uh, basket molds. And uh, so it's really special that I got to weave on that. And so uh, mentioning shifting kind of priorities in the pandemic, I'm, I'm back to teaching my son Caleb again. And he indeed was a toddler when we actually held the first festival at the College of the Atlantic in 1994. And he's gone on to become a pretty good youth basket maker. And um, but hasn't made a lot of baskets in the last few years that he would be um, sharing my booth this year on the grounds of uh, the Abbey Museum if the event were happening. And so I'm really proud that we get to work together. He's using some of these ancient tools, but he's really needing to learn the process um, from start to finish, which is, which is really arduous and time consuming. And so um, he's been coming to my house and you can see kind of the striping pattern on his blue piece below that, that mirrors my glove box. So, you know, kind of that family 
family and tribal pattern, if you will, because a, a lot of people use that in their basketry. And then the piece on the left is a piece he sold in Bar Harbor about three or four years ago. Um, this is him. We had, you know, did some sweetgrass braids and um, the final piece, which sold actually to um, some friends who I can't name because it's a surprise for someone else. Um, and then um, this piece, we, these pieces we wove together a couple of weeks ago, just um, over a series of sessions. And he still needs to make a cover for his little um, drum basket on the right hand side. But I didn't realize how much we were working off each other's energy and design and style. And so um, this is, uh, of course, a bean jar basket. And um, we kind of thought we were going to be able to do some of this by FaceTime. And we've been interrupted multiple times thinking, oh, you know, was he around people because he's, you know, he was working still at the time before and um you know does he does he need to you know quarantine for a while before he comes back and so we thought we'd be able to do some of this electronically but we found out you really can't transfer this kind of intergenerational knowledge electronically um we sat back and forth beside each other and he passed the basket back and forth to me in the same way that my teacher and i did 32 years ago and so I was really reminded of that and thinking, what was I thinking that we could do this electronically? You know, I think maybe later on when he's, you know, more advanced, but he's, he's doing very well and I'm, I'm really proud of him. This was a barrel basket that I wove last year for the Weewinigan exhibition at Colby College Museum of Art and now uh, resides in the permanent collection there. And then these are just some recent um, pieces that I made. Um, this year. And the other piece that I have for sale, in addition to the glove box, and I'm, I'm making bean jars. So if you're interested in a bean jar, please contact me. But the other piece I have for sale right now is this indigenous heirloom corn series. And so this tray with the three pieces are available. And I started weaving these as a, a real nod to the um, organic farmers in Maine who are bringing back like the, especially the ancient New England flint corns, like the callus flint corn, the Abenaki rose corn. And then on this piece, you see, I have a Hopi blue corn thrown in there. So um, this is my contact information. And um, it's kind of an awkward looking website right at the moment, but I was showing it to just remind myself to let you know that I still have the website that's in the Abbey database, but I'm actually working on a new one that will launch with all the other Santa Fe Indian Market artist sites in a couple of weeks. And so, um, you know, I'll be able to actually see what I have available and purchase right off the site, which is, you know, the way we all need to go. So that's been interesting with that going virtual. And there are a lot of, you know, advantages of people trying to make the best of this time. So um, thank you very much. And I appreciate the opportunity and answer any questions anybody might have. All right. Thank you, Teresa, so much. Um, I do have one question for you. We are kind of uh, moving along, getting close to the end, and we do have one sure, more sure. artist, but uh, I wanted you to uh, see if you could expand on that a little bit more. I mean, you're an award-winning artist. You've shown your work at many prominent markets. Um, why are art markets so important for Indigenous artists, and, and, and especially in this time, um, you know, continuing the art market tradition in the virtual form that we're doing? Why is it important for us to, you know, do the best we can, you know, with this format as well? But why are markets so important to Indigenous artists? Yeah, well, I think, you know, others have mentioned it earlier. It's just, you know, our ability to, to be together, to network. Um, a lot of my really good friends are um, indigenous basket weavers from all over the nation that I've met in person in the Indian markets. And so um, during this time, it's a chance for us to still be able to connect. I think some of my friends are online now watching and I appreciate that. And they're learning about the other fellow artisans on this site. And so I, I think that's maybe the biggest part of it. And then, of course, you know, a number of people do earn their living this way. And I mean, it's I'm really proud to be carrying on this tradition, too, of selling, you know, art for a couple of hundred years in our tribes in Maine. And that's that's really quite unusual if you um, think about it. You know, I, I believe this is Maine's oldest continually pra continuously practiced art form, you know, along with bird bark canoe building, et cetera. But these woven um, which I always think that, that birch bark canoe reminds me of a big basket anyway, but um, now I think it's, it's just, yeah, you know, we need to stay connected. 
Yeah, and I, I think in your presentation, you really drew some great lines. Uh, the fact that uh, even though Bar Harbor, you know, formerly Eden, right, in the time okay. of predicators, uh, even during that time, there was always a continuity of uh, maintenance of native presence here uh, in what is now Bar Harbor. And that has continued, you know, for hundreds of years and has now uh, taken the form of the Native American Festival and basket makers, and, and as well as now the uh, Abbey Museum Indian Market is now adding to that as well. Um, but yeah, this is a long standing tradition. This has been going on a long time. And when it comes to this particular area, um, basket making and buying baskets uh, is literally, you know, uh, 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 centuries old. Uh, so thank you for bringing your perspective uh, and bringing your artwork to our presentation. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, um, her, uh, Teresa's profile is linked directly in the comments, but you can also go to abbeymuseum.org, uh, look under uh, markets and then the artist profiles. You will find Teresa and all of our other artists there. You can contact her directly uh, about any of the pieces that she saw that she has for sale today. And with that, I'll give you the last word, Teresa, as you sign off. Okay, Upchurch and uh, Willy Wen, until we meet again. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we are down to our last artist for today. We are getting uh, down to it, but uh, don't, uh, just because this artist is coming up last, don't think that uh, it's because they're least. You know, this is one of those special occasions where we get to incorporate somebody um, that's uh, very well known uh, and, uh, you know, kind of a, a great showstopper here for the end, and that's Gabriel Frey. Uh, Gabriel Frey, I, I've uh, you know known uh, his mom and Gabe and Jeremy, the Frey family, uh, tremendous basket makers. And Gabriel, in his own right, uh, has really set himself apart. Uh, in many ways. Uh, and he specializes in utility baskets. So we've seen, I uh, talked a little bit about Richard's potato baskets and the utility baskets that he makes. Uh, and many of the Ashplant basket makers we've seen make what we call fancy baskets, but uh, Gabriel actually specializes in the utility baskets, but he brings his own special flair to it, uh, as well as, uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, each and every one of these artists take this art form and they make it their own. Uh, he's from the Passamaquoddy tribe. Uh, his art is an expression of his worldview. And without any further ado, I'm going to turn it right over to Gabriel Frey to begin his presentation. Thank you for being with us, Gabriel. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thanks a lot. That was a, a great, uh, great opening. Um, yeah, I'm Gabriel Frey, uh, Passamaquoddy basket maker. Um, come from a basket making family, but within the Passamaquoddy tribe, well, most Wabanaki um, families say that you come from a basket making family is sort of, it goes without saying. Um, most families uh, throughout our history have had um, a lot of basket making within uh, their families. And then the two schools of thought being like the fancy basket lineage or the utility basket lineage. Um, and so I started out making strictly utility baskets from my grandfather's style, like the pack basket that you see behind me, um, which is a very traditional sort of um, strictly utility. Uh, my grandfather made pretty much pack baskets or scale baskets, which were also large, um, very industrial style um, baskets. And over time, I've taken that same philosophy that same sort of lineage and just adapted it a little bit to um, today's utility which um, varies wildly right like taking something like that big basket on the subway would be a little bit difficult to sort of like manage so um, having that same aesthetic that same sort of like shape which most anybody can recognize as a, a pretty ubiquitous of the northern Maine woods sort of style. I've um, just shrunken it down a little bit. So here's an example of uh, a smaller piece. And most of what I have uh, with me are, are pieces that I'm, I'm working on for other orders. So I have very little um, for sale for this particular market. Um, but this is a, uh, I guess, a take on a pack basket uh, fanny pack. So it has um, the 
herringbone adaptation in the front um, with a leather lid, which is something that I've sort of refined over the years. Um, and then it has uh, a leather liner inside, which it's big enough to hold a cell phone, some keys, um, and maybe a wallet. Um, the full design would have a piece on the back, which would hold a belt so it can actually like go on your side. Um, again, that's something that I've just been sort of like continuing with. A lot of um, what my grandfather did was just ash, just strictly working with ash, not even dyeing the materials. Uh, over time, I've started working with um, natural dyes. So again, incorporating different weaves that you would see in some of um, our fancy baskets, but then adapting them to smaller utility baskets. So this is another one that I'm working on. Um, it's indigo and matter root. And so that's, again, just a, a variation of a herringbone weave to create the pattern up the front. And it has that sort of um, saturation, reduced saturation in the, the indigo dye. Um, but it gives a great contrasting color. And so this is, again, this is a, a back order <laughs> I've been working on for a while. Um, and then another one, which is a series of multiple dyes, but uh, I call this one the um, sunrise basket. So it has that uh, variation from earth into sun, uh, sort of the uh, homage to uh, the Dawnland. Um, and this one is completely in process. So what you see with this other one, when it has the liner already cut out, the liner's actually flapped over and then I'll trim that off when I add the binding. So this is a, a deer hide um, lining that I put in the basket. But again, it has that pack basket shape, which is common to you know the larger pieces. Um, but again, it's refined for today's use. So there's a, a little pocket for your change or you know anything else. Um, and uh, yeah. Uh, the similar thing to what Teresa was saying, I use a lot of um, our old tools that have been passed down. Um, I, I work with uh, my grandfather's molds or even other antique molds that I find um, that really help carry on the sort of like traditional style that, that comes with our baskets. But then also like something that all of our generations have done is transcend and include. So we're working with the traditional material, um, but then including um, our own sort of style, our own voice. It's an expression of, of how we see the world. So um, yeah, I guess um, I don't really have anything else to, to add to that. So um, Chris, if you're yeah, I am here. How you doing, Gabriel? Uh, that Good. Was awesome as always. And and by the way, uh, Gabriel was also a participant in Digital AMIM this year uh, and uh, is a frequenter of the Abbey Museum Indian Market. We do get to see him a lot. Uh, and it's always great to have you here with us. So we actually had a question come in from uh, one of our commenters here. Um, what does your creative process look like? Do you plan your baskets out as you go or are you inspired as you're making them? That's interesting. Both. Um, I, I sometimes will get an idea and then um, have to work through the process. So um, a lot of the concepts for the purse started out as like making a tiny pack basket. When my daughter started, when she learned how to walk, I made a pack basket for her, for her size. And then looking at that basket was like, wow, that would be an interesting purse. And the first couple of versions looked completely different than what I have today. Well, I'm learning how to work with leather and learning how to combine leather with ash. Um, so I'd say the, the creative process is this um, constantly evolving uh, conversation with the material um, and then the idea of utility, right? Like um, having wearable art 
be relevant to today and carry on traditions from the past is sort of like finding that marriage that also expresses your own aesthetic. I think it's, it's, um, it's a constant thing. So um, always learning, always uh, sort of like trying something out. I've, I've made a few baskets where in my mind, it was going to be amazing. <laughs> and then once I start weaving the material, it's like, this is not going to work at all. And so even, even though those are frustrating, I think it's still, um, it's still great to have that experience, right? Like there's no such thing as a failure. It's just uh, a, an idea that didn't work out. <laughs> then you always learn aspects of that sort of come to some other fruition or maybe go into a different direction where you're like, wow, that was actually, uh, you know, five generations down from that original idea. It's something that's completely different, um, but incorporates all of those things that you learned along the way. Yeah, that, that's an amazing insight into the process. I mean, you know, um, we, we look at the finished products that the basket makers bring to the market and we don't realize that some of those got thrown away or, uh, you know, started <laughs> and taken back apart. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> and I know even, uh, you know, as artists, um, you know, pieces that you sell that to uh, the patron would look just absolutely perfect. I know as artists, you can always pick out the, the, the mistakes or the very slight imperfections that nobody else would notice. Uh, you know, so sometimes that's part of the process as well. I got one last question for you, and then we're going to uh, wrap up for today. Um, a lot of the, the, the Ashland basket makers use forms, uh, and many of them are, are passed down from generation to generation. We have seen that. Uh, but do you make your own forms for baskets as well yeah yeah i um so when i was learning how to make baskets from my grandfather uh, he actually wouldn't let me use a mold for for the first several baskets that i made because learning um how really to to work with the material um and then once i sort of became competent enough doing it on my own he finally <laughs> allowed me to to use some of his molds um but yeah, I, over time, whenever I have an idea of something, some new style, um, like, you know, these were all made on molds that I made myself. Um, and so, yeah, I do. I make my own molds. I make my own gauges, um, a lot of my own tools, because you can't really buy anything from Walmart when it comes to indigenous arts. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Gabriel. Uh, we are actually just a few minutes over time, so I'm going to uh, end our presentation here, but I wanted to give you the last word as you say goodbye. So thank you very much for being with us today, ladies and gentlemen, Gabriel Frey. Uh, Willie Wood and Updich, uh, thank you so much for putting this on. Uh, it's been great. All right. So, oh, folks, we have made it to the end of our digital Native American festival and basket makers market for today. I just want to give one more huge thank you for joining us. Uh, once again, if you have seen pieces from our uh, artists that were featured today and you would like to contact them, uh, the links are in the comments. You can go directly to their profiles or you can go to abbeymuseum.org, look under the tab for Marcus, and then look under the tab for uh, the artist profiles, Digital AMIM and Digital NAF. Uh, and some of the other artists that we could not highlight, I'm going to name them all, the Na Native American artists that we uh, have participating in uh, the artist profiles are some of the ones we heard from today, like Barry Dana, but also other ones, Natalie Dana Lolar uh, with Diverse Arts, uh, DeConte and Brown, also a digital AMEM participant, clothing and some really, really fashionable jewelry that they got going on. Uh, James Francis, we heard from today, as well as Gabriel Frey. Ganessa Frey, another Ashland basket maker. Jeremy Frey, a uh, very well-known Ashland basket maker. Uh, Hawk Henrys from the Nipmuc Nation, Diverse Arts, a uh, musician as well. We heard from Elizabeth James Perry. Um, Molly's uh, grandchild, Geo Soctoma Neptune, uh, another uh, very well-known Ashland basketry maker. Jennifer, we saw today. Pamela, 
Odusis Cunningham, basketry, Ash basketry, as well as other. Butch Phillips, we got to hear from. Jennifer Pictou with her beadwork. Uh, Anne Pollard Ranko, uh, diverse arts, painting and illustration. Teresa, we heard from today. Richard, we talked about a little bit. Richard Silly Boy, uh, as well as hearing from Francis Salk Toma. So those are the uh, NAF participating artists that we have profiles for. Uh, please come to abbeymuseum.org and uh, contact the artists themselves uh, and you can buy directly from them or commission pieces. And ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of our event. Uh, as uh, uh, the executive director for the Abbey Museum, Willie one to you all for being here today, for joining us, for taking part. Uh, and we look forward uh, to future events with you, uh, whether it's in the virtual realm or hopefully sometime in the future uh, in face-to-face uh, uh, -face meetings with one another. And uh, uh, we will keep you updated on uh, when we open the Abbey Museum, which will hopefully be sooner rather than later. We just wanna make it a safe experience. With that, ladies and gentlemen, Willie One, up judge, I will see you again. <laughs>